In this presentation, we are going to focus on two measures which are used to assess the performance of a company division, return on investment and residual income. In a decentralized organization, divisional structures can exist. Here, a division can also be referred to as an investment center, where the division manager has responsibility over revenue, costs and capital expenditure or investment. It is common for a division to set financial targets and for its performance to be assessed accordingly. It's important to note that the following characteristics are desirable when looking to successfully appraise a division's performance. These characteristics underpin much of our discussion around divisional performance assessment. Goal congruence. Ideally, divisional managers should make decisions that are in the best interests of not only that division, but also the company or the group as a whole. Autonomy. In a decentralized organization, the divisional manager should be able to act and make decisions independently of the company head office. Hence, the divisional manager has full control and can assume full responsibility. Performance assessment. Goal congruence and divisional autonomy should mean the evaluation of the division's performance is possible and fair. A conflict between goal congruence and autonomy can often arise. If managers are allowed too much autonomy, then, while seeking to maximise the profits for their division, they may make decisions that are not in the best interest of the company or the group as a whole. However, if their autonomy or independence is withdrawn, then this is likely to have a negative impact on their motivation, thus making it difficult to accurately assess performance. These matters must be considered when evaluating the performance of a division. Divisional performance can be assessed using the return on investment and residual income methods. Let's take a look at each in turn. Assessment of divisional performance can be based on the return on its investment. This is calculated as the net profit of that investment divided by the investment cost. Traditionally, this has been a widely used measure in divisional performance assessment. However, variations of the return on investment formula do exist. So sometimes it is necessary to follow any direction given in the scenario presented. Let's take a look at an example involving two company divisions. B Company has two franchises, X and Y, in different parts of town and wants to monitor the performance of the two managers who have full control over the investments. The cost of capital of the two franchises is 10%. Currently the return on investment of each franchise is 15%. Each franchise manager is currently considering the following separate investments. The budgeted capital requirement for franchise X is 500,000, which is expected to yield a profit of 70,000. Franchise Y requires a capital investment of 750,000, from which a profit of 95,000 will be generated. The requirement is to calculate the return on investment of each of the proposed franchise investments and to comment upon the results. For division or franchise X, the return on investment is 14%, being the profit of 70,000 expressed as a percentage of the capital investment of 500,000. Similarly, for franchise Y, a return on investment of 12.67% would be generated, being profit of 95,000 divided by the necessary investment of 750,000. We also need to be able to comment upon and make sense of these results. It's important to note that each franchise manager has autonomy. In other words, each franchise operates and makes decisions independently of company head office. Each divisional manager will make decisions that are in the best interests of that division. In this case, return on investment is being used to assess the potential investment. As return on investment of both divisions, or franchises, currently stands at 15%, the manager would only be willing to accept an investment opportunity which will add to, or at the very least maintain, this return on investment. Thus, as the expected return on investment of 14%, and 12.67% for franchise X and Y respectively are both below the current return on investment of 15%, both franchise managers would reject the investment opportunity. If either investment were accepted, then the overall return on investment of that franchise would be reduced, 
which would not be in the interests of that franchise or division manager. Given that the cost of capital for both divisions is 10%, it can be argued that both investments should be accepted, as it would benefit the company as a whole. Hence, the decisions of Division X and Division Y are not in the best interests of the company, meaning there is a lack of goal congruence between the divisions and the company. Or, the behaviour of the divisions can be described as dysfunctional. Furthermore, if divisions are making decisions that are not advantageous to the overall performance of the company, then it is difficult to fairly assess the performance of that division. As per the above example, it can be argued that using return on investment will encourage divisional managers to make decisions that are in the best interests of that division, but not necessarily in the best interests of the company as a whole. This is referred to as dysfunctional behaviour or non-goal congruent behaviour. For this reason, other methods of divisional performance assessment, such as residual income, have evolved. The residual income is calculated as the profit minus the imputed interest charge. The imputed interest charge represents the minimum acceptable return to the investors, calculated as the investment cost multiplied by the company's cost of capital. Generally, if the residual income is positive, the investment is acceptable to the division. Let's examine residual income in the case of the two franchises X and Y, which are considering the same two investment opportunities. In this case, we are required to calculate the residual income of each of the proposed franchise investments and to comment upon the results. So, for franchise X, the budgeted profit is 70,000. The imputed interest charge of 50,000 is calculated as the company's cost of capital of 10% multiplied by the necessary investment of 500,000. The residual income for franchise X investment is 20,000 positive. For franchise Y residual income is also 20,000 positive. This is calculated based on the profit of 95,000 less the imputed interest charge of 75,000. The imputed interest charge here is also indicative of the minimum return required by investors of 10% on Y's investment of 750,000. Using residual income as a basis for making a decision would result in the investments in franchise X and franchise Y being accepted, given that the residual income for both investments is positive. Accepting these investments would also be in the best interest of the company, meaning divisional and company goal congruence would be achieved. As the divisions are acting in the best interest of the company, then it would also be easier to fairly assess divisional performance. These differences between return on investment and residual income should be appreciated. Ultimately, however, both return on investment and residual income use similar information in their calculations. As is evident in the above examples, residual income could be viewed as the superior method of investment appraisal, as given that the calculation is linked to the cost of capital, goal congruence should be achieved. Goal congruence avoids dysfunctional behaviour, which maximises company profits and facilitates divisional performance assessment. Return on investment, on the other hand, can result in dysfunctional behaviour, meaning company profits are not maximised, thus hampering fair evaluation of that division's performance. Return on investment, however, is a relative measure, in that it is expressed as a percentage. This facilitates interdivisional comparisons. Also, a percentage return is often easier for people to understand. Residual income is expressed as an absolute measure, or is expressed in monetary terms, which arguably makes it more difficult to compare divisional performance. Also, Estimation of a cost of capital is required for the residual income calculation, whereas no cost of capital is required when calculating return on investment. Other than the calculations above, other factors need to be considered when evaluating or comparing divisional performance. How experienced is the divisional manager? Perhaps they are new to the role. How buoyant or otherwise is the market for each division's goods and services? This will impact the financial results of that division. What is the age profile of the assets within each division? Return on investment and residual income calculations will improve as assets get older, since the investment figure will reduce 
by the amount of depreciation each year. This may discourage managers from investing in newer, more efficient equipment, simply because in the short term it reduces the division's return on investment or residual income.